So we work on the article about. Uh, Uh, we worked on the article about climate, peace, and security in the Arab region. And um, so we are going to start with uh, the introduction and summary of the article. Then we will raise two points that we found interesting and we wanted to look more in depth. So um, for the article, we can start with the links between climate, peace, and security. So the relationship between climate, peace, and security um, is complex and uh, interrelated to other trends and factors. And um, conflict-affected affect, uh, contexts are likely to be uh, more vulnerable to climate impacts. And the quality of governance and efficacy of institutions affect the capacity to respond uh, to climate risks. So now we can see uh, more the context of the Arab region. And so the Arab countries are um, affected by different risks. Uh, so uh, climate effects is one of the risks. And um, the impact of climate change are increasing and affecting uh, the region with, for example, exposition to extreme temperature, floods and droughts. The Arab region is also a region of uh, wide disparities in terms of income and uh, resources, for example. And there's also an institutional challenge uh, because institutional governance has been weakened by uh, conflicts and corruption, so it's harder to um, address the climate risk in this region. Take care of the slides. <laughs> okay. So um, here we can now see uh, the manifest how uh, climate uh, security manifest is manifesting in the Arab region, and so um, we can see that it. Uh, affect uh, peace and security landscape and uh, particularly agriculture as we just saw before with the author the article so um, agriculture is particularly vulnerable to climate change um, uh, because the change in temperature and uh, precipitation can lead in a decline in agricultural uh, productivity for example uh, but we can see that it's affecting uh, all the arab country in different way so, for example, Somalia uh, is more dependent on agriculture because we can see that 80% of um, the total employment is in agriculture. So here we can see wide disparities uh, and that uh, this risk is more pronounced in some country than in other, for example. Uh, climate change also affects um, competition over resources, for example, water, as we just saw. Um, and it's exacerbating pressure uh, in area with scarce resources and conflict can arise over those resources. So for example, um, in 2021, uh, 18 out of 22 Arab states uh, were considered water scarce. And it's also affecting uh, climate change and conflicts are affecting migration and displacement. And we can again see that there's a disparity between countries. So for example, in Palestine, almost half of the population is displaced and in uh, Syria, uh, a third of the population is displaced. And at the end of the article, we have some uh, policy consideration and recommendation to try to cope with uh, all of that. So the first one is having a good governance, social cohesion and inclusivity. So it's crucial for resilience and mitigating security and tension. It's also uh, important to, integrate, to have integrated approach to tackle complex climate, peace and security challenge with uh, integrated strategies and to have tailored policy to uh, cope with the disparities of the region and uh, having region-specific policies uh, needed due to resource vulnerability and fragility variation. And um, so to finish with uh, the first part, we can say that we really liked uh, reading this article and it gave a really nice overview of what's happening in this region and we could understand more deeply the context of the Arab region. So uh, now we are going to talk about, so we heard a lot about fragility and poverty. So now we want to look at the other side of the um, Arab region, which are the rich Arab states, because we felt like it's incomplete to talk about inequality without talking about the rich. So when I think of um, 
climate change and the Arab countries, then one of the first things that come to my mind are the Arab OPEC countries, which like uh, the fragile states in the region, they also face extreme climate risks because of geographical factors. But as we all know, they face this economic trade-off in that their economies are heavily dependent on fossil fuel exports. Uh, historically, these countries have adopted a strategy of trying to obstruct um, climate change agreements, like Saudi Arabia is known to repeatedly go into climate negotiations, international negotiations, with the strategy of preventing countries from cl coming to an agreement. So we wanted to ask you about that. Uh, but another legitimate question to ask is on the economic restructuring and export diversification of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries so that they are ready for uh, the green energy transition and do not need to obstruct it. Um, next, uh, consumption. When we talk about inequality, so Qatar, not the United States, is the country with the highest per capita ecological footprint in the whole world. And five out of the top 10 in the world are GCC countries. So uh, I just wanted to ask whether um, and it, this is a paradox of the region where most of the countries are very poor and fragile, but also places like Dubai are these icons of extreme wealth. So should, is this something even worth uh, thinking about, considering that the climate awareness and the state of democracy in the Gulf countries is not the same as in um, North America or in Europe. So there cannot be the same kind of a climate movement. But also, um, it should be relevant to the question of wealth redistribution in the region. So if you have any thoughts on that. And finally, about conflict and refugees and migration. So thank you so much for the case study of Jordan. It was very interesting and hopeful in spite of the challenges. But again, we wanted to ask about the role of the richer Gulf states. And for example, during the Syrian crisis, there was a lot of debate over their role, what they should be doing, how much they are doing. It seems that countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, they donate a lot of money to refugee centers in other countries, but they do not accept refugees, um, most of whom are in countries like Turkey and Lebanon, but not so many in Saudi or the UAE, which are very rich states. And uh, we also hear a lot about just the general state of rights of migrants and refugees. And they face a lot of legal barriers to getting their residencies extended or getting work permits, uh, even more in many respects than they do in European countries, which we hear about a lot more. So we would like to ask you about that. And finally, Talking about conflict has to be a much more political discussion than it was in the, the paper that we read. So the article that we read was won by a, a United Nations team. Um, the United Nations and such international organizations that were formed with the express purpose of preventing or resolving conflict, but over the decades and again in the last three months, we um, are seeing are we seeing these mechanisms fail? Are they obsolete? Or is it that we only see the failures and it would be a lot worse in their absence? So um, yes, so, so what can be done in this situation? Uh, so talking of international organizations, Camilla is going to talk a little more about that. Well, uh, my colleague has stated some important part that the states should be uh, responsible for the part of the climate change and climate security. But also there is another important sector. I mean, another important sector is like multilateralism. In this part that I am going to mention, we are going to divide into the international organizations, all the international cooperation and finance. So, well, first off, uh, what about the international organizations? Well, according to uh, Kyohen, one of the most renowned uh, internationalists, uh, international organizations have the potential to facilitate cooperation and without international cooperation, uh, the prospect for our species would be very uh, poor indeed. Of course, this statement might be over exaggerated, uh, given that, uh, but at the same time, it's realistic because it illustrates how the international order uh, is now, right now. Uh, on the other hand, also, well, there might be some positive points, 
because it's not only just only going to be uh, to see it from the negative side, because uh, international organizations, they provide guidance, technical assistance to underdeveloped countries. But on the other hand, there are some discussions about their impact and how they are influenced on some underdeveloped countries. Like, for example, in the case of the International Monetary Fund, because by imposing a common model for those developed countries. And what about their influence? How uh, is the do international organizations have an own agenda? Because, for example, from my experience, I work for an international organization for the ILO. Maybe this case is uh, interesting because when you are inside of international organization, it's different. You have good intentions, but on the other hand, when you want to design and implement uh, and give some technical assistance, also there are some grievances with the government, with the national policy, because they have their own point of view. So it is kind of difficult to find a common uh, a common ground. So as the uh, as the prof invited professor professor stated, uh, there are some problems uh, within some countries because the ministries doesn't work together, don't work together. But in the other case, we should consider that if we consider that uh, as a, an, an external variable, the international organization, then it is going to be more difficult just to find a common uh, ground. For the case of finance and international cooperation, in order to tackle just the climate change and climate security, it's important to consider the uh, finance and international co uh, cooperation. So I think, like uh, as the uh, professor said, like uh, adaptive, adaptive capa capability for the country, countries is going to be affected by economic, social, and institutional factors. Uh, so th in that regard, it's important that under well underdeveloped countries uh, just take into consideration, uh, just obtain international findings and other ways of assistance as a key. However, in the case of the Arab states, uh, as it was stated, it tends to be concentrated in the less vulnerable countries like Jordan, uh, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. Also, we try to find out more information, and also we found out that it is a same, the same trend so I think like uh, instead of the, the less capable countries, like uh, the private countries like Somalia um, and Yemen, they are not the ones who are receiving that international fund. However, I mean, like we, it is not only depending on international funds, like the case of the Green, green Climate Fund. Uh, the positive side of the key of the policy brief is that they highlight a part of the uh, taking into consideration the South-South cooperation. However, also there is a problem because for the case of the international cooperation, uh, also it's uh, it is there are no possibilities to have, for example, in a case because due to the corruption. Uh, in the case of the of Somalia, Somalia uh, one of the projects to finance the, uh, the to the system of farmers. It was freeze due to the corruption of government because one of the ministry of uh, the ministry of environment. I think that he there was like a supposition that like he sent money to one of bank account of someone who was one of his relatives, something like that. So maybe this is one of the main reasons that also the Arab states cannot have uh, can can get the the, the finance in order to tackle the climate change and climate uh, security security climate. Uh, but also, I mean, like they are lacking of, uh, of development of a technical assistance and on the other hand, how to just focus and identify their main uh, needs. So, well, that's all. Uh, we have some questions. Well, I mean, that also my, co my colleague has stated, like the case of the rich Arab states, the role in the energy transition, restructuring Gulf economies, high consumption, response to refugees from Arab conflict regions, accountability for conflict role of international organizations. However, there are some two questions that I would like to pose to the professor. Like, are there examples where international organizations have successfully influenced government solutions regarding climate change or in the case of climate security? And what are other steps should the Arab states take to improve their chances, chances of receiving international and regional uh, finance for climate change projects? Well, that's all. <laughs>